Okay, so I'm going to talk about running Rust on FPGAs, uh, which is something that I've done recently with a team at work. Uh, so we built a, a system that runs Rust on an FPGA. Uh, I won't go into the details of that product, but it's all open source, so you can, and I'll link to it at the end, so you can have a look if you want. Uh, I should add a quick disclaimer that this is my own opinions and don't reflect those of my employer. Uh, a quick outline of what I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk about what an FPGA is, what a soft CPU is, talk about the FPGA toolchain that I've been using, which is an open source toolchain, talk about SVD files and SVD to Rust, uh, talk about writing a hardware abstraction layer, and then talk about interacting with your embedded code. So first of all, what is an FPGA? Uh, it stands for Field Programmable Gate Array, and it's a collection of logic gates that can be combined, that can be programmed in the field. So that means like while the device is out in the field, you can upload new firmware to it, and it will reprogram those gates. Uh, so logic gates like AND gates, OR gates, those kinds of things. Uh, it lets you create and run uh, complex digital circuits without getting a custom chip made, and is often used for prototyping chips before you make them, but you, can, you don't have to use it just for prototyping. You can use it in real products, which uh, we did with our, with our project. Uh, Modern FPGAs consist of a range of components, basic components like lookup tables, which take several bits and produce an output bit. Uh, so you can use that to create an AND gate or an OR gate or something more, more complicated. Um, uh, Flip-flops, which store a single bit of information until the next clock cycle. Uh, an I.O., which lets you effectively read and write the pins on the FPGA, so you can send data and receive data. Uh, in addition to that, lots of FPGAs have more advanced components that you could build from the more basic components. So things like RAM, which you can make just using flip-flops. If you put enough flip-flops together, you can make RAM. Uh, but you've only got limited flip-flops in your FPGA, and so having dedicated RAM lets you use it more economically. And things like multiply accumulate units, which, again, you can make them using lookup tables and flip-flops, but it's more efficient to use dedicated hardware. So a soft CPU is a CPU that runs on something like an FPGA. Uh, it's uh, often used as RISC-V, since the licensing is a lot easier. Uh, you don't have to pay licensing fees to say ARM or something like that if you wanted to use the ARM instruction set. Uh, and if you find a bug in your CPU, you can fix it, assuming you can figure out what the bug is. And you can extend your, cus your CPU with custom instructions, which we did for our, with our project. Uh, so I'll quickly define what a system on a chip is. So you don't just have a CPU running on the, soft, on the FPGA. You'll often have uh, a whole range of different peripherals. Like you might have the CPU and then an internal bus. And the RAM might be on the bus, so the CPU can access the RAM. Then you might also have a spy peripheral, which talks, lets you talk to a spy flash. So your instructions might be, your code might be stored on the spy flash. Uh, and the CPU, when it wants to access it, sends a request out to the internal bus and retrieves it from the spy flash. And then you might just have other buses like I squared C in order to talk to other peripherals that are connected to your device. So it's an SOC, or system on a chip. So the open source tool chain that we've used is uh, various different components. One of them is Litex, which we use for defining your SOC. It provides lots of components that are pre-built, things like soft CPUs, buses, uh, caches, Ethernet controllers, flash storage, that kind of stuff, and lets you pick which ones you want and mix them together to create an SOC. Uh, Amaranth is, uh, lets you write high-level code for defining digital designs. Uh, so though we use that primarily for writing, for implementing custom instructions, which are then mixed into, with, into Litex. Uh, Yosis takes your digital design, which is compiled down to something like Verilog, and synthesizes it, which means converts it into a form, takes it and figures out which components are available on your specific FPGA and maps your design to those components. Uh, then NextPNR takes the output from Yosis and performs place and route, which means arranging all of your components into the FPGA's fabric in order to uh, make them fit, first of all, and also make the timing work. So if you, the electrical signals within the FPGA take time to get from one place to another, and if you're running your FPGA's clock at a particular speed, you need to make sure that the signals get from, from one component to the next before the next clock cycle. 
And so Next PNR handles optimizing the layout within the FPGA. The output from that is then uh, fed into a, to a tool that's specific to your specific FPGA in order to produce a binary bitstream that is actually what's given to the FPGA to program it. So SVD files are XML files which document the layout of memory. Uh, so for example, you might say that an Ethernet controller is at a particular address and it's got, at a particular offset, you've got a control register and then a couple of bits for enabling it and setting speed, have other bits for sending and receiving data, that kind of thing. Uh, chip vendors often supply SVD files to document their chips. Uh, the idea is that this SVD is machine readable uh, and so, <coughs> and, and handily for us, Litex can generate SVD files for the specific SOC that you've given it. So without SVD to Rust, you might write code that looks like this, where we've, say we've got an LED that our FPGA is talking to, and we've defined a constant for the memory address that lets you control that, SV, that LED. And now we do a, a volatile read in order to read that memory. It needs to be volatile because we need to tell Rust you can't remove this, like it has to actually do the read. Uh, and then once we've got that, we OR it with one in order to set a bit and then write it back. Uh, so th this is a, a fair bit of code and more, more annoyingly is that it defines the constant for LED address, which is also defined in our SOC definition in Litex. So we don't want to have that duplication. So SVD to Rust generates this code for us effectively and lets us write something like this where we, we can just set the bit. We don't need to define a constant because it's all in the generated code. Uh, it's still a little bit high level though. Oh, sorry, it's a little bit verbose still. And so the next thing we do is create a hardware abstraction layer which wraps around this low level generated code and provides a nicer, a nicer interface. So we can then just write something like led1.turn on. Uh, and we might also put this behind a trait so that we can have two implementations, one for the real hardware and one for use in tests that mocks the hardware. <coughs> so one thing I've found particularly useful when working with embedded code on FPGAs or otherwise is to have a host side command line tool that does everything. So it builds, builds the firmware, flashes the firmware to the device, uh, gives you an interactive uh, command line where you can give commands to the device, uh, lets you see panic messages and debug print statements coming from your code. Uh, and I've used a range of different interfaces in order to build such tools, so JTAG, Serial, I squared C, and Open OCD, uh, which are all different ways to communicate with your with your device. <coughs> so a few resources. Uh, CFU Playground is um, where we've done a lot of the development of custom instructions, particularly working with machine running machine learning models. So if you're running a machine learning model and you want to accelerate it by writing custom instructions, that's well, that's good. Uh, Litex, which I mentioned, and Amaranth, which I mentioned earlier, and then HPS firmware is a project in Chrome OS, which is the project that we worked on. Uh, it's all open source, so if you want to go and have a look, uh, feel free. Uh, any questions? <coughs> I can also show, if anyone's interested, I can show a demo, a demo later on of a, something running on real hardware, but I won't try and do that online. So the question was for debug print statements, do you just use print line or do you use something else? Uh, so most recently I've been, th uh, there's a few different options. Uh, there's D format, which is specifically for embedded use and avoids increasing your binary size. So I've used that a bit. Recently I've mostly just been using the log crate, uh, which does do the formatting on the device uh, because I'm not too constrained for space at the moment. And yeah, so then log can have multiple back-end outputs, so you can write an implementation for your specific way of getting the data off the device. Uh, but log is, yeah, log is mostly what I've used. Any other questions? So yeah, the, uh, the system is, does use no STD, uh, and we mostly didn't use an allocator. 
the only thing we actually needed an allocator for was so that print, we had some C++ code, which is the TensorFlow Lite Micro, and that uh, needs to allocate in order to print, use printf, but everything else doesn't do any allocation. Uh, how's it different from regular Rust development on embedded? Probably the main thing is that you're defining the SOC yourself, and so there's no peripheral access crate, and probably no HAL already made for you, and so you've got to write, you've got to generate the, the peripheral access crate, which is what SVD to Rust generates, uh, and then you've got to write the HAL yourself. Um, that's probably the main difference. And also you can decide what, what bits you do on the FPGA versus what bits you do in Rust code. So you can move that boundary a bit, and we have done that a bit where we've had, had code that's written in Rust, and we've decided to like do a bit more in the FPGA logic, and then also conversely take logic out of the FPGA and put it into Rust code in order to simplify the, the FPGA's programming. Uh, sorry, yep. So the question was, how does the custom instructions interact with the, the HAL, sorry? Yep. Uh, so the, the custom instructions, we didn't actually call them directly from Rust because we were using TensorFlow Lite Micro, which is a C++ code base. And so the Rust code called TensorFlow Lite Micro, and then the C++ code called the custom instructions uh, from within its implementation. Uh, but we could have called the custom instructions from Rust if we'd had a need to, and it's basically just inline assembly. You just generate some inline assembly, and it, um, <coughs> yeah, it doesn't interact at all with the HAL because the HAL is about reading and writing memory, whereas custom instructions are just part of the assembly code. <coughs> 